And Liz has been working as a, a field hydrologist on the Casper Creek experimental watersheds for more than two decades. Uh, she's done a lot of things, uh, gotten her hands dirty, literally and figuratively, in all aspects of watershed research, from field work to analysis and publication. Today, what she's going to talk about is some work she's done on decommissioning uh, road on the uh, Texas State Forest. So there you go. It's up to you now, Liz. All right. Thank you, Richard, and thank you all for tuning in this morning. Um, Richard asked me to talk about active management to reduce sediment production, and I hope to do so using insights from the Casper Creek Experimental Watersheds and also look at some things that have been done elsewhere in the region. Our research work on Casper Creek uh, focuses on understanding sediment processes and the synergy between management and the natural. So we examine um, flow and sediment and the changes that result from forest management practices and how these practices, um, these evolving practices, have affected these parameters. And I want to say at the outset that we know more about how disturbance enhances sediment production than how active management can reduce it. But um, nonetheless, we have a 50-year stream flow and sediment record, which, will provide, which does provide some unique insights into the magnitude and duration of sediment production from varied land uses. And so we'll examine this record in light of harvest, roading, and some rehabilitation work that's been done in Casper Creek. So, all right. So the questions I'd like to address are, what do we know about sediment production in an unmanaged or natural setting? How does forest management affect sediment production? What did we learn from the 1998 riparian road decommissioning in the South Fork of Casper? What is the magnitude and timing of sediment savings from decommissioning work? And what do we know about legacy sources? How important are they to the present? The experimental watershed program was begun in 1960 to study the logging effects on stream flow sediment and fish. The experimental watersheds are located in the headwaters of Casper Creek, about five kilometers inland from the Pacific Ocean, and are on the Jackson Demonstration State Forest. We use a paired watershed design to look at flow and suspended sediment measurement at weirs and upstream tributary gauges. Since 1962, we've done two major experiments. The 473-hectare North Fork watershed was logged in the early 90s. This was partial cable clear-cutting with new roads and landings near the ridges and water course protections for the Class 1s and 2s. Earlier, the South Fork had had a mainline riparian road constructed in 1967. And most of this road was built within 60 meters of the Class 1 stream. The 424 hectare South Fork was then logged between 71 and 73 using selection harvest and tractor logging. And this was prior to the implementation of California's Forest Practice Act. So we have a data-rich environment to um, examine these issues of active management. And all right, so what do we know about sediment production in an unmanaged natural setting? Uh, sadly, not enough. We um, know most of the Redwood region um, forests were harvested um, over 100 years ago, and these um, were heavy-handed methods, clear-cutting, burning. The um, swales and tributary channels were used as transportation corridors, both by oxen and by mechanized yarding systems, early mechanized yarding systems. And also, splash dam um, logging was common. Klein, Lewis, and Buffelbin um, analyzed turbidity records from 28 coastal watersheds in Northern California. And they grouped their sites by timber harvest history. And what they found was that the pristine or unharvested group mean their turbidity there was um, at the 10% exceedance level was only eight, while older legacy harvests and low harvests and high harvests um, had 10% exceedance levels of 16, 32, and 61 turbidity units, respectively. And turbidity can be a pretty good surrogate for sediment in our area. 
So they also found that the rate of recent logging um, and drainage area were the best predictors of these 10% um, exceedance level turbidities. And it wasn't the roads, but roads were probably um, certainly strongly correlated with rate of harvest. They constructed turbidity duration curves for four harvest rate categories. And what you um, jumps out at you here is that the um, turbidity duration curve for the pristine or unharvested is about an order of magnitude less than that for the high harvest areas. And the low harvest and legacies are somewhere in between. So how does forest management affect sediment production? Well, we know that cutting trees reduces interception and transpiration, thereby increasing peak flows and storm flows. You have more storm power and more ability to erode. We also know that tractor yarding compacts soils. It displaces sediment, and it potentially redistributes runoff. Now, these effects were probably, were definitely far more severe um, in the 60s and 70s than they are today, but um, tractor yarding still does have some impacts. And modern cable logging systems keep the impacts away from streams, um, so they do reduce direct impact to riparian areas, but again, they're not entirely benign. So what are the key findings from Casper Creek with regards to sediment yields? We know that sediment loads are highly variable, and they depend both on the magnitude and distribution of storms, also watershed treatments, and legacy conditions. So on the South Fork, that early 70s tractor logging more than quadrupled sediment production. And about two decades later, we saw an increase again as a result of road and skid trail system deterioration. In contrast, cable logging in the North Fork resulted in a doubling of sediment production, and this was strongly correlated with storm flow increases. We also saw that after the pre-commercial thinning in the North Fork, um, sediment loads were enhanced, and also further enhanced by large um, cut unit landslide that occurred in 2006. So, if we look at um, South Fork sediment loads through time, um, regressed on annual peak flow, I w this is where I really wish I had that pointer. But <laughs> anyways, um, we see that the initial road construction, the riparian road construction that occurred in 67, um, resulted in modi modest um, surplus sediment on the order of 44 tons per kilometer square per year. And then we see the largest deviations in the early 70s when the tractor logging occurred over a three-year period. And we saw, um, we see that the deviation there or the excess sediment was about 116 tons per kilometer square per year. With um, this going on as late as 1983. And then we had a relatively quiescent period before in the mid-90s we again saw an upswing in the sediment production in the South Fork, and this time it was associated with deterioration of the road. We started seeing more frequent um, crossing failures and slides related to um, diversions in the watershed. And this um, led to the decommissioning of that riparian road in 1998, and subsequently loads have been moderated, um, but they are still about 25 tons per kilometer squared per year above the, um, the pre-harvest condition. Contrast to that, what we saw on the North Fork watershed, um, this graph here again, we're looking at time since logging on the X and percent departure from expected sediment load on the left, on the y-axis. And the red dots are from a tributary gauge. We always, almost always see higher loads, um, larger magnitude sediment loads in the tributaries than on the main stem. I want to draw your attention to the black, which is the Arf Stein um, main stem class one gauging station, above which 46% of the area was clear cut 
24% was broadcast burn, and less than 2% was put into new roads and skids. And what we see is between 92 and 11 that the excess sediment here in the main stem was only 5% more than predicted. Another thing to note, though, is that the um, large flows and the landslide activity of 2006, um, we are still seeing sediments being mobilized through that main stem reach today. And currently, um, loads at RF are about 40% above the pre-harvest prediction. So we use uh, several different channel study methodology, methodologies to look at the impacts of this surplus sediment on the riparian or on the stream, um, V-star, large woody debris, and cross sections. V-star is a measurement of fine sediment in pools, and we've been looking at this since the early 1990s. And in general, the trend is a steady downward trend in both the North Fork and the South Fork. You do see, however, that the uh, North Fork had a bit of a pulse associated with the um, logging in the early 90s. And then the South Fork in the peak in the late 90s, you can see another um, pulse lasted about five years um, associated with the decommissioning. And then finally, in 2006, we had uh, major landslides in both watersheds, and we see a little bit of a blip associated with that. But in general, um, V-star in both reaches is fairly low and fairly stable. Now looking at cross-sections, um, I kind of want to move through these kind of fast, but um, we're looking at distance from that Arfstein gauge on the North Fork, and at the top, that is the pre-harvest we didn't see a lot of change in the pre-harvest period, a net scour of 17 um, cubic meters. Then with logging, we did see recruitment of new woody debris, development of log jams, that's what those vertical bars are, and a net um, scour of 133 cubic meters. Later in the 90s, we saw some of that storage being taken up with sediment that was um, being routed from the upstream tributaries. So we saw a a decrease in net channel area. Keep hitting the wrong down arrow on my computer. All right, and then um, subsequent to that, things have been generally calmer with bigger changes in, in bigger years. Um, again, the, the trend is net scour. L large wood is still accumulating. Um, the big landslide we had in Dollard added storage, but also added major bank scour. And it's still, um, yeah, that's about enough said there, I think. So what about the erosion sources? Well, on the North Fork, in-channel erosion dominated sediment transport after the 1990s logging. And this, of course, is in the absence of the large landslides, which um, sort of overwhelmed the background erosion rates for a short period of time. We did see two major landslides occur nearly a decade post-harvest. And this was, these occurred when root strength was expected to be minimal and after the pre-commercial thinning had um, been done. So flows were again elevated. In contrast to this on the South Fork, that earlier less regulated tractor logging resulted in lots of a skid trail and road-related erosion, and lots of these uh, erosion sources remain active today. So here are a couple of photos showing you what these um, gullying and head cut processes look like in our watershed. The, they're both widespread throughout both watersheds, uh, vertical channels, entrenched, incised, vertical incised channels and head cuts which um, migrate episodically upstream, introducing sediment. Uh, in the North Fork, after logging, we did see um, an increase in tree throw related mass wasting, especially in the riparian um, 
watercourse protection zone and also along the margins of the cuts. Um, but there wasn't a lot of delivery associated with most of these features. In addition, we had two major landslides um, that occurred more than a decade later, and they delivered significant sediment via debris torrents. So when you think about legacy sources, I think most people think about deteriorating culverts and crossing failures. And these were very common, or fairly common in the 1990s, two decades post-harvest in the South Fork. Um, what the chairperson has disconnected. The conference will now end. By the Thank you. Please stand by. If you are the chairperson, press the star key now. Your conference will begin when the chairperson arrives. Please wait. You will now be placed into conference. Hello, am I back? It says restarting the bridge. Let's see. Pardon me while I test to see if my Vocals are back. Richard assures me I am. So here we are again. Um, I was speaking about legacy sources de and deteriorated culverts. Crossing failures are common um, legacy sources that I think are what jumps to people's minds when they think about this source of erosion. Um, but other things that are sometimes not quite as visible are the large fill slopes. Um, that were commonly created w during road construction of the in the era of the 60s and 70s, and also the use of inboard ditches to drain roads. And together, these tend to route water, um, transfer water between watersheds, and the water just looks for a place to exit the road. And usually, it finds either a fill slope or a uh, crossing fill and saturating these fills leads to some um, mass wasting. OK, the uh, road, State Forest Road 600 was decommissioned in 1998. And Pete Caffaretta, Bill Baxter, and I wrote up a forestry note reporting um, detailing the methods, costs, and the first eight years of results. So I'm going to. Um, talk about those results and also add some add some new research. Uh, 
I'm, excuse me for a minute. I want to just make sure I'm being heard. You're being heard, Liz. OK. I thought I had a new um, message pop up. This is my first ever webinar. What fun. Your turn, Gary. <laughs> OK. So the riparian road decommissioning in Casper resulted in um, channel adjustments that were reflected in increases, sizable increases, in our first year sediment yields. And during the subsequent decade, we did see decreased yields, but only for small storms, those with a return period of less than 0.4 years. 12 years after treatment, we found that 10 of our 35 treated crossing sites still were actively eroding, but the, this was a relatively minor sediment source. And even after decommissioning, South Fork turbidities exceed thresholds of concern more frequently and are more persistent than on the North Fork, suggesting that there is still continued input of fine sediments from this disturbed riparian road corridor. In 1998, 4.6 kilometers of road was treated. This involved 26 treated stream crossings, eight relief culverts, and eight other sites that were missed, small stream or skid diversions, they were missed in the planning phase, but they became evident once the uh, inboard ditch was obliterated. And I also want to point out that the large um, black plus um, in the northeast corner is um, crossing CX-4. It's the largest crossing. It was placed on the main stem above the old splash dam that had failed in the 70s. And behind it, um, behind this road crossing was major century old deposition. And this will become interesting soon. All right, so the road decommissioning treatments specified were that um, crossing excavations would be excavated to a depth of the original channel. Slide, side slopes would be laid back at not more than 50%. Jute netting would be applied within 30 meters of the channel and conifers would be planted at three meter spacing. In addition, the entire road length um, was cross-drained with drains being installed at a 5% grade. Again, the side slopes not to exceed 50%, inlet depth of 0.15 meters, and it was not required that the ditch be obliterated. In only the upper two kilometers of the road, outsloping was prescribed, and this was done at a 10% grade required ditch and berm obliteration and conifer planting. So here are some photos of the treatments as they were in August 1998, stream crossing culvert excavation. This was our, our largest fill volume removed. And then um, the cross drains, you can see two in the center picture. And then finally, the outsloping in the upper segment of the road. We um, made several erosion measurements. We surveyed 10 of the sites. We surveyed, surveyed them as they were built in 1998, after the first winter in 1999, after the second or third winter, and then again in 2011 after another decade. We um, surveyed longitudinal profile and three to five cross sections per site. In addition, at all of the sites, we estimated erosion volumes by um, measuring the scoured area at one meter intervals and summing that. In addition, uh, we qualitatively assessed the sediment delivery of pot potential and activity level at 35 sites in 2011. Now, sediment yields at Casper Creek are assessed at the main stem gauges using turbidity threshold sampling to determine um, storm event based loads. And also, annual loads are assessed um, by adding in the weir pond deposition to the sum of suspended sediment loads. Here are some photos from that first year. Um, on the top, we have pictures from crossing CX-4, which is that major um, crossing on the main stem at the site of the splash dam. 
And even before our major 44-year peak flow of March 99, we were seeing some significant incision and widening at the site. And it really went to town in um, March of 99. We um, had about 150 cubic meters of erosion at this one site during that one winter. On the lower left, we have CX-7, which is um, a site where the contract specifications were not met. The side slopes um, were left too steep, and the excavation was incomplete. What happened here is when the um, contractor got to the site, um, he was concerned that it would require an extraordinary amount of work to remove the um, a volume of material needed to lay that slope back on the left. It, um, there was a landing up at the top here on the left-hand side. And so he was kind of given a pass on that. And it ended up being one of our more um, productive, sediment productive sites. Um, contrast to that, on the lower right is CX-13 after the same storm. And it is looking pretty good. We had a good result. You can see that the uh, original grade was attained by the evidence of the unearthed old growth stump. And there was only minimal scour at the site. Other erosion we saw was um, bank sloughing at decommissioned crossings. And in addition, the surface of the road itself would um, channel flow and fine sediment, delivering it into the um, restored crossings. What we didn't anticipate was that our use of the road as a foot trail and the popularity with mountain bikers would, would um, enhance the sediment production after decommissioning. All right, so here we have a very busy slide showing first year sedimentation and erosion. On the top, we have sediment production in the South Fork, uh, at the South Fork Weir. And this is a combination of the suspended and the pond deposition. And you see that the post-decommissioning um, load was third highest on record, almost on a par with what we saw after logging. Now, the sources of the sediment that year Again, we did have that 44-year peak flow. The sources of the sediment, about half of it was an inner gorge landslide. And that landslide was on the opposite side of the creek from the treated riparian road. We also saw mass wasting around the watershed from much from untreated roads and skids. And that was about 25% of the total erosion measured that year. Um, I'm talking about the slide on the lower left now, by the way. And then our treated crossings produced about 28% 20 of the total erosion inventoried in the watershed that year. That 28% measured to be 651 cubic meters, looking now at the right-hand lower graphic. Um, and that equated to 57% of sediment production measured at the South Fork Weir during that 99 water year. Subsequent, um, subsequently, erosion continued, but at a far, far less slower rate. Um, looking at channel erosion in terms of cubic meters per year, um, the second and third winter was only about 54 cubic meters per year. And in the last more, more recent decade, it was down to about 15. And that compares to our background rate um, of in-channel erosion that Leslie Reed estimated to be 291 cubic meters per year for the South Fork. All right, and about 80% of the erosion occurred during the first winter. Now, in 2011, we looked at sediment transport potential, and it was rated as higher extreme at 12 of our 37 sites. But at the same time, we saw that many um, of our eroded volumes were smaller than previously measured. So they were starting to um, trap wood and also store sediment. In addition, there was a lot of um, vegetative cover, which made assessment of the margins of the historic scour difficult for the field crew. Our survey data um, quantified 
some changes as well. Um, let's see. Overall, we're looking at a, a adjustment at one side of the channel profile, and incision was common and ranged from 0.3 to a meter in depth at the sites. <coughs> and <coughs> after the first year, it was much less. But even in 2011, um, we saw that over the last decade, uh, the average um, incision rate was about 0.09 meters. Also, we saw a head cut retreat evident at all 10 of our surveyed cross-section sites. And uh, we saw that these 10 sites enlarged by about 20% in the decade since last measured. And these were our largest sites. These weren't um, necessarily a random sample. All right, so we um, used regression analysis to look at sediment loads before and after decommissioning. And we found that smaller storm loads decreased after 1999. But our regression showed no difference before and after the road de decommissioning, except for these small storms with a return period of less than 0.4 years. So that's a storm that occurs about seven times a year. No difference for the larger peak flows. Looking at turbidities, we tallied um, turbidity records by stream ecosystem stress threshold. Um, this is after um, Randy Klein's work in 2008. And we found that looking at the left, starting at the left, um, South Fork turbidity tallies exceeded North Fork's by 120% for those extreme turbidities that were greater than 100 turbidity units. For severe turbidity greater than 50 turbidity units, um, South Fork exceeded North Fork by 60%. And for moderate turbidities, um, South Fork exceeded North Fork by 50%. Those are turbidities greater than 25. So with few exceptions, South Fork turbidities um, are higher than North Forks for the period 96 to 2010. And these were statistically significant differences. And where North Fork is higher than South Fork, um, for example, 2006 for the 100 NTUs, those are examples when landslide activity was influential. So no doubt the riparian road plays a role, a prominent role in this difference. Main stem loads are enriched relative to tributary loads at the upstream gauges as measured above the treatment sites. And we did do some occasional above and below sampling at these treated crossings, and this confirmed enrichment during the, 2000, the decade of the 2000s. OK, so what have we learned from this 1998 riparian road decommissioning? Um, several good lessons, and they have been applied on the Jackson de Demonstration State Forest to other decommissioning projects, and results have improved. So the lessons and recommendations are that pre-project planning, of course, is so important. You um, need to thoroughly evaluate restoration needs in all the areas that will be inaccessible after your target road is decommissioned and make sure that you consider this before finalizing any treatment plan. Uh, examples of comprehensive watershed assessments are the Sinkion Wilderness Road Rehabilitation Report by Merrill, 2003, and also in the California Salmonid Stream Habitat Restoration Manual, the um, chapter by Pacific Watershed Associates on inventory and sediment control guidance. The other thing is um, to think about site specifics. Can the necessary treatment specifications be applied, and are they appropriate? Some places, like, for example, that crossing 7 and crossing 4, we had special problems that maybe would have been um, better to do some more site-specific, take a more site-specific engineered approach. On the main um, crossing where the splash dam depositions were stored, we did end up, um, after the first winter, bringing in some large riprap to armor that head cut, 
and deposited some stumps, redwood stumps in there, and some logs. And the stumps have sprouted, and we have new growth stabilizing that channel. Also, can't um, underestimate the need for diligent inspection to determine both the appropriate channel excavation depths and to ensure that your stream banks are sloped back to prevent the slumping. And also, it helps to have someone with an experienced eye to locate and remedy any missed or dormant diversions. As for technique, armoring um, the new ex newly excavated channel beds at large crossings with big drainage areas is um, important. Also adding large roughness elements and or grade control structures. I would say that, you know, where cost permits, armoring is um, always a good thing to do. The road surface needs to be cross-stained to reduce the likelihood of new diversion problems, especially if you're not obliterating your inboard ditch. Ripping and outsloping will enhance revegetation and also mitigate new diversion problems associated with post-treatment recreational trail use or research trail use. And you can achieve cost savings by permitting some of the work to be done by tractors, for example, initiating culvert um, fill removal and also moving that material to a stable location rather than end hauling. So what is the magnitude of sediment savings that one can expect from a riparian road decommissioning? And when are these savings to be realized? Well, <clears throat> the at-risk volume is far less than the excavated volume. We didn't estimate risk volume for this riparian road treatment, but we have since done so for the remainder of the South Fork watershed. And that um, led me to surmise that it risk volume was about 40% of the um, ex excavated volume. So what does that amount to? In sediment savings, it's about um, let's see, estimate the erosional the sediment savings are about 10 times the erosional cost. Another way of looking at that is the crossing failure erosion was reduced by about 90%. Didn't see a lot of problems on the road segments themselves. Most of our erosion was, did occur in the um, treated crossings. Now, earlier in this um, presentation, I showed you that the excess sediment production on South Fork decreased by about a half in the decade after treatment of the riparian road. But again, the more robust analysis using event-based sediment loads did not show a change in load. So the, the change that we saw was more a reflection of the magnitude and timing of those storms. So it would appear that the savings have yet to be reflected in, in um, large event sediment loads. There have been a lot of other studies done in the Redwood region, and they show progressive improvements in the state of the art of our road decommissioning work and they also document declining erosional costs. Marion Mayday did a, a landmark study on Redwood Creek and showed that treated roads contributed about one quarter of the sediment produced from untreated roads. And 20% of her excavated stream crossings accounted for about three quarters of the post-treatment erosion. In the 17-year um, post-treatment period, Average erosion yields were about 50 cubic meters from this work on Redwood Creek. But the 12-year uh, recurrence interval storm had almost no erosion at 80% of treated sites. Then Klein in the upper, looked at the upper Matoll River, and he saw much smaller per crossing erosion of only 12 cubic meters per site. And again, 20% of his sites contributed about half the sediment volume. And he estimated that the post-treatment sediment delivery measured was about 14% of the estimated pre-treatment potential. 
specific watershed, watershed associates looked at the Elk River watershed, and again, 20% of the crossings produced the bulk of the erosion. They estimated only an average of 13 cubic meters from 52 sites after um, between two, four, and seven winters. And finally, Flanagan et al. Uh, looked at Headwaters Forest Preserve and Lax Creek, uh, tributary to Redwood Creek. And they found some of the smallest post-erosion, post-treatment erosion volumes, 11, point, 11 meters, 11 cubic meters in Headwaters and a little bit more, twice that, in Lax. And most of their erosion, 99%, occurred the first year. And they said the erosion resulted from channel incision and that woody debris was helpful for armoring and adding roughness. All right, so what about legacy sources can we say now? What can we say about them and how important are they to the present? Well, road decommissioning is really the first significant proactive methodology that's been widely applied to treat legacy sources. The focus has been on the riparian and on the class one and two streams, but there's a lot more upland work that remains. Those more incipient in-channel processes of gullying and head cutting continue, and they result from canopy alteration, alteration of forced canopy processes, namely reduced interception and reduced transpiration. We see that um, there is excess sediment and enhanced turbidities in both legacy and modern harvest areas. And this remains a concern. Sullivan um, looked at, reviewed 10 years of monitoring data in elk and freshwater. And she found that declining sediment loads, she found that sediment loads were declining and attributed that to mitigating the dominant sediment sources. Her sediment budget showed that roads and landslides were a large part of the sediment sort in the sources in the past, but a lot of the road system had been upgraded and decommissioned, and landslides were becoming less frequent because a lot of those more vulnerable areas were now off limits to logging. So sediment budgets now show that the legacy sources are an increasing portion of the annual sediment load, and this included things such as old skid trail crossings, eroding banks left from initial logging. And much, is, much, is <coughs> much the same story we see in the legacy of South Fork Casper. We looked at um, over 400 stream and swale ca crossings around the watershed. About three quarters of those had failed partially. We found only 16 of 235 stream crossings that were deemed stable. On average, 10 cubic meters had eroded from um, these sites. About 20% of the stream crossings were actively diverted or at risk of diverting. We um, also found lengthy entrenched diversions and gullies that were routing water um, between watersheds, between sub-drainages. We, we re-inventoried landslide voids, and we found that although 70% of them were documented in the 1976 post-logging data set, another 30% of the volume had occurred in the last 35 years. Most of our at-risk sediment was still in stream crossings. So in conclusion, sediment production in unmanaged or natural redwood region forests is not fully understood. And we need to use process studies to get a better handle on this and so we can use build theoretical models of what um, the processes are in the absence of management. Forest management affects sediment production by a variety of mechanisms, and these can be both direct and indirect. The forest practice rules um, are addressing a lot of these impacts. Um, South Fork Casper's Riparian Road Decommissioning decommissioning case study um, doc was unique because it documented the sediment load effects and not merely the erosional consequences. And the two are not necessarily the same. 
Also, the magnitude of sediment savings after decommissioning is now approaching about 90% of the at-risk volume. However, the time necessary to realize these sediments, these savings may be decades. Decommissioning is often proposed as a solution to the short-term or as a mitigation to short-term enhancements from timber harvest. But the erosional consequences of harvest begin immediately, and the benefits from decommissioning can take decades to be realized, I think. So that's something to um, ponder. And we've only really just begun to evaluate and mitigate upland legacy sources. We need cost-effective, field-tested approaches to mitigate these, litigate these legacy sources and to reduce in-channel erosion. I'd like to thank my colleagues, Leslie Reed and Jack Lewis, who provided key components of these analysis, and also the many, many field personnel who helped to gather and compile data. Also wanted to let you know that on June 28th, Casper Creek is, we are having the um, Casper Creek workshop celebrating 50 years of discovery. It is free of charge. It'll be taking place in Casper and include morning lectures and an afternoon field trip. And you can go to our website and register for that now. So thank you very much. Thanks. Well, if there's some uh, questions over there, um, okay. Mike, do you want to bring those into the and open it up? Uh, Kate Moore uh, asks about, um, looks like the erosion data makes it look like there was little or no post-harvest maintenance. Uh, was that the case? And would maintenance uh, during storms mitigated some of the erosion problems? Um, yes, part of it, part of the reason there was little um, in, in this era, I think the state force is doing a much more uh, a much more thorough job of this now. But in that era, uh, the road was not really passable in the winter, so it would be closed off and it wouldn't get a lot of inspection except for maybe um, on an annual basis. Um, also, what would active road walking and maintenance during storms, what would mitigate erosion problems? Basically just uh, you know, looking at your roads during the storms, which is something that, for example, Weaver recommends. Yes, uh, I think. To it. identify incipient problems, really, especially flood culverts. Exactly. And um, you know, stops are small and they can't be everywhere all the time. But um, it certainly certainly helps prevent problems, especially if everyone who's out there keeps their eyes open for problems and not just wait for the person that has that duty assigned to them. Yeah. Brad's got a question here about uh, how much sediment delivery is attributable to mountain biking. Uh, in my mind's eye, I can see that decommissioned crossing that you showed. Uh, and uh, the ruts from the mountain bikes. Um, we've got a second question: that how, what is, how much of the d demise and fall of streamside alders contribute to sediment loads? I think you addressed that when you said that the wind throw uh, that occurred in the thin riparian areas, uh, there wasn't a lot of sediment delivery from from that wind throw. Is that correct? Right, but that was on the North Fork, and he's asking about oh, okay. the alder in the South Fork. So, you know, we can't, for the first question, we can't really separate how much sediment is coming from mountain biking versus our own use of the trail for access to our gauging stations, which we do, of course, when it's pouring rain and when the um, conditions at their, are at their wettest. Um, all in all, I think it's minor. I think it adds to background turbidities. Um, how much does the demise and fall of streamside alders contribute to sediment loads? Well, I'm not really sure about that one either. I think that alders are um, declining and then they're being incorporated as woody debris into the stream channel, which sometimes results in scours, sometimes results in storage, but the, the alders are um, quick to decompose. And the South Fork um, lacks, lacks wood in general. Um, do we have any storage on the floodplain? 
more so on the North Fork than on the South Fork. Um, don't see a lot of storage on the South Fork. I don't know if we've really qualitatively assessed that recently, though. Uh, Brooks got a question here uh, about whether the road was recontoured back to the hill slope. I think you suggested that it was only outslope for the upper two kilometers. That is correct, and it wasn't um, recontoured to the the grade the hill slope grade. It was only outsloped at ten percent, which seemed to be pretty effective. Like I said, to um, keep the water dispersed and running off that segment of road. But it yeah, wasn't made to look natural. I think we better um, move on. Liz, thanks so much. And uh, I would encourage everyone to come out to the Casper workshop. Well, not everyone, but as many people who can make it come out to the Casper workshop. It's going to be uh, a great time. So uh, thanks again, Liz. And uh,